tonight on All In. The answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah, there has to be some form. The punishment begins in Texas as Texas Republican politicians run away. Do you agree with Attorney General Braxton's actions and what he did? Just call it pressing. I Tonight, the growing calls for action as American dystopia sets in. Then, my office will seek a speedy trial so that our evidence can be tested in court and judged by a jury of citizens. Why Jack Smith's Supreme Court action could be even smarter than it looks. Plus, why cell phone data from inside the White House on January 6th could be a big deal. My reaction to it is that's a, a terrible tweet. I thought it was wrong. And as the president hosts Vladimir Zelensky in the White House, how the Biden rift with the prime minister of Israel spilled into public view. When all in, start right now. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Nearly everyone watching tonight has either had the experience of being pregnant or being close to someone who's been pregnant. And it's, it's one of the most intense and overwhelming experiences in this life. I mean, <laughs> I felt this the three times that my wife has been pregnant, even as the person adjacent to it, just around it, not really having to do anything. I'll never know what it's like to have to physically go through it. And yet still, I mean, in the early stages, there's this real sense of precariousness. Every one of those early checkups, your heart is in your throat. You wait to hear the baby's first heartbeat. And then you wait to tell your friends and family because you know that miscarriages happen. And then you get past that 12-week mark, which you've got in your head on the calendar there, the first trimester, when the vast majority of those losses occur. And you think, you hope that you're in the clear, and you probably share the good news, and then you start making plans for the shower and the nursery and the birth, and it all seems real. Kate Cox has been through this before. She's got two children. And when she learned she was pregnant with her third in August, she was overjoyed. Kate Cox and her husband, Justin, always wanted a big family. In October, she had a blood test to screen for some fetal conditions and to learn the sex of the baby. She was excited to find out if she was carrying a boy or a girl. And then the Coxes got the worst possible news. Their unborn child had a genetic condition called trisomy 18 that causes severe heart defects and other abnormalities. The condition is almost always fatal, with most pregnancies ending in miscarriage or stillbirth. And the vast majority of those who make it through delivery survive just a matter of days. And Kate and her husband, Justin Cox, learned through repeated ultrasounds that the fetus that she was carrying had, had multiple serious conditions, including, quote, a twisted spine likely due to spina bifida, a, a neural tube defect, an irregular skull and heart development. Cox's doctors also told her that her health was now at risk. She visited the emergency room multiple times with severe cramping. Her two previous deliveries were difficult, both ending in C-sections. And if doctors induced labor, she would be at a high risk of uterine rupture and losing her uterus, meaning she wouldn't be able to carry children again. Another C-section would also make future pregnancies more dangerous. Kate Cox and her family received all of this awful, awful news in their home state of Texas, which, of course, has some of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the country. It has been at the forefront of the anti-abortion movement in the 18 months since Roe v. Wade was overturned. In fact, it leapfrogged ahead of that overturning with SB 8. It's very controversial law. Now, Republicans dominate the state government at all levels, and they have used the state as a laboratory for their vision of control over every Texas woman's body. Every pregnant body in the state of Texas is now fundamentally the state's property. So Kay Cox and her doctors didn't get to choose what was best for her. The Republican-controlled state did. Cox and her doctors decided that an abortion was the safest option to protect her health and her future fertility. But she could not have the procedure she needed because in the state of Texas, any doctor who performs an abortion could be criminally prosecuted and face life in prison. Amidst this devastating, torturous situation, learning that her much-wanted 
child will not survive, and her own health and fertility are now at risk, Kay Cox was forced by the people who are supposed to represent her to sue those people, her own state, for the medical care she needed. And think about that for a second, amidst this crisis for this family. They had to find legal representation. They had to make their names and the most intimate, vulnerable facts about themselves public. They had to go to court to ask a judge to rule that Kate Cox and her doctors could decide what was best for her. And last week, a state jurisdiction court judge said yes. That judge issued a temporary restraining order against the state of Texas, blocking the government from prosecuting Kate Cox's doctor and anyone who would assist in providing her with an abortion. But rather than let that ruling stand, Republican Attorney General Ken Paxton wrote a letter threatening the doctor and the three hospitals where she practices. Paxton claimed the judge's ruling, quote, will not insulate you or anyone else from civil or criminal liability for violating Texas's abortion laws, including first degree felony prosecutions. And then, not content with the threatening letter, not content with prolonging the mental and spiritual torture of this woman, he petitioned the state Supreme Court asking them to intervene and stop Kate Cox from being able to receive an abortion. And all the while, Kate Cox and her family were waiting in limbo. She's got two kids. <laughs> She's past 20 weeks pregnant. Her health was deteriorating. She had been to the emergency room four times in one month. So she was finally forced to flee the state of Texas, to flee her own government that's supposed to represent her as a medical refugee. She had to leave her home and she had to leave her doctors who know her and who have cared for her and her hospital. And she had to leave everything familiar and safe to have a scary and emotionally fraught procedure in a strange city with a strange doctor in a strange hospital. Because that's what Ken Paxton wanted. That's what state Republicans wanted that she be in a hospital in another state, terrified at this moment in her life. And the very same day that Kate Cox fled her home state of Texas, that state's state Supreme Court ruled against her. They said, no, no, no. She could not receive the medical care that she needs in her home state. The panel of Republicans in robes even had the gall to question the doctor's judgment, saying, quote, she could not, or at least did not, attest to the court that Ms. Cox's condition poses the risk the abortion exception requires. That is, that the pregnancy seriously threatened Kate Cox's health or life. Nope, they don't like it, sorry. The state Supreme Court says you can't get the procedure. It's a Republican government at all levels, right? State level, telling a doctor and a pregnant woman she cannot receive the medical care she desperately needs. It is the nightmare scenario come true. There it is, right now, happening before our eyes. The nightmare scenario that proponents of abortion rights have warned about for 50 years. It just happened to Kate Cox in Texas, and it is coming for everyone. Make no mistake, this movement, the one that you just saw pursue control over Kate Cox's body to appeal to the state Supreme Court, to issue threatening letters to the hospitals, that movement is not going to relent. They will never give up on their aims of exerting that level of control over every single woman's body in this country. Every voter in this country needs to understand that they could be Kate Cox. And everyone in this country needs to understand that they could be Kate Cox's loved one. Kate Cox could be in your family and you could be going through that. And we all will be if Republicans remain in power and expand that power. This is a central issue the Democrats must be talking about in this election up and down the ticket. President Joe Biden did release a statement tonight saying, in part, no woman should be forced to go to court or flee her home state just to receive the health care she needs. But that is exactly what happened in Texas, thanks to Republicans elected officials. And it is simply outrageous. This should never happen in America, period. And here's the thing. Republicans know that this spectacle, this despicable spectacle that just went on in Texas is politically toxic for them. We can tell because they're trying hard to pretend that this didn't just happen. Get this, yesterday, Fox News interviewed Texas Governor Greg Abbott. 
and did not ask him a single question about Kay Cox. And today, both Republican senators from the state of Texas refused to say anything about it. Do you support what the Texas Attorney General did in blocking Kate Cox from getting an abortion after she found out her fetus that's strict, was That's strictly a matter of state law, Do you think not it was federal right? law. Are you worried about women in your state whose health may be at risk by Texas laws like Kate Cox? Well, I'm a federal uh, I, I, official. But this is I'm something that's happened official, in your state. So I'm not going to comment on what uh, state officials are doing. I'm happy to comment on anything that I'm responsible for. I wanted to get your thoughts on what the Texas Attorney General is doing in the case against Kate Cox and blocking her from receiving an abortion. Do you have any comment on that? Just call her president. Do you agree with Attorney General Braxton's actions and what he did? Just call her president. I have. I actually haven't received an answer. So is there anything that you'd like to say Jesus. right now on this? Call her president. Molly Duane is a senior staff attorney at the Center for Reproductive Rights, which represents Kate Cox in this case, and she joins us now. It's great to have you here. Um, first, I, and I don't want to um, violate any privacy from a woman and family that have already incredibly bravely put themselves out there, but I do want to ask how Kate Cox is doing at this hour. She's doing as well as could be expected, um, but I do want to just sort of wind the wheels back and think about what she's been through over the last week and a half, right? A week and a half ago, she received the worst news of her life, confirmation that her third child had trisomy 18 and would likely be stillborn or at most would survive for minutes, hours or days. She was also told that because of her two prior C-sections, she was at increased risk for uterine rupture, hysterectomy, and as you said so eloquently, she wants to have more children. Yeah. She wants to grow her family. What did she do in the last week and a half? She found a lawyer. She decided to file a lawsuit. She received an order from a court saying, yes, you are entitled to an abortion. Then she had the attorney general threatening her family and her doctors. Then she had the Texas Supreme Court say, no, nope, we're going to put a hold on this. We need more time. And then she spent three agonizing days waiting for an answer before the Texas Supreme right, Court. Right. I forgot. No. They paused that earlier ruling that said, yes, you can get this medical care. They said, no, 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 you can't. Wait, we're going we're gonna to think it over up here at the Texas State Supreme Court, whether we think you should be able to do this. And she just had to sit there and wait. Right. So it, a week is a short amount of time for a court, but for a person, a real person in a medical emergency with young children and a family, it was agonizing. She spent most of the weekend in bed. And so I just really want people to put themselves in her shoes and think about who they want in the medical room with their husband and their doctors. Is it Ken Paxton or not? One of the aspects of this case that I think it has highlighted is this notion of exceptions. Um, there is under state law in Texas apparently exceptions for women that may need an abortion as a medical necessity. We have seen multiple uh, women, including other clients of yours, Amanda Zarowski, among others, who have been denied reproductive care they, they felt they needed under the exception law. What does it say about the actual lived reality of exceptions in the state of Texas or any state that has them if this is what plays out when a so-called so exception actually applies? This is what I really want people to understand about abortion bans. Exceptions don't exist. Because if Kate Cox can't get an abortion, then I don't know who can. And you often hear yep. about, well, 15 weeks is a compromise, or don't worry, there are exceptions. Republicans want to pass a 15-week abortion ban. I have heard politicians saying that. That would mean a national 15-week abortion ban that all of us are Kate Cox. because in And she's got nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. This is also, I have to say, there's, there's a little bit in the ru ruling, um, uh, a little bit in the reads of the ruling, but I actually found this like such, Kate, my wife, uh, who you know, uh, the law professor, pointed this out to me. There, there, there's something so disingenuously bad faith about the court ruling, which basically says, well, if you can get a medical, like if it's a medical necessity, they say, a woman who meets the medical necessity exception need not seek a court order to obtain an abortion. Under the law, it is a doctor who must decide that a woman is suffering from a life-threatening condition during pregnancy. Basically saying like, well, what do you mean court order? Go ahead if it's medically necessary. You got the attorney general of the state writing to threaten this woman with 
felony conviction. And the court has the gall to say, well, we don't really see a court issue here. I mean, the doctor can just make the call. We'll see what happens. Let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm laughing because it's not funny at all. But the courts are saying they don't want to be involved. The medical board says they don't want to be involved. The attorney general is not going to do anything to help and is going to run roughshod on the medical community in Texas. And meanwhile, real women's, real pregnant people's bodies and lives and families hang in the balance. And that should be deeply troubling to people across the country. What does it say to you? And you're you're a lawyer. You're not you're you're, you're not a, 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 a politician or a po politician staffer. But what does it say to you that uh, the two senators who represent Kate Cox, she's their constituent, have nothing to say about this? That uh, Greg Abbott doesn't get a question about it when he appears on Fox. What what does that say to you? Well, I, I have to talk a little bit about Amanda Zorowski for, for a moment. Yeah. because She's been I am, on this program as well. Yes. So I also represent Amanda and 20 women in the state of Texas who are challenging these restrictions before I even met Kate Cox because they and their doctors are saying as loudly as you can, we don't know how close to death we needed to be. Our doctors didn't know, and our health suffered as a result. And when Amanda Zorowski testified before the Senate Judiciary hearing, Neither of her senators were in the room. They came in to make statements, opening statements, about how much they opposed abortion, and then they left before she testified. So the fact that Ted Cruz ran away from reporters asking about Kate Cox doesn't surprise me at all. I asked you this beginning. I want to just circle back around. Again, I don't want to violate privacy, but is, is, is Kate Cox and her family doing... I mean, I know it's been an awful, arduous situation, but is she doing okay? She is. She's stayed offline, which I think was probably the best thing one could do in this situation. She's doing fine. I appreciate you asking. And I have to say, with the outpouring of support we have received from people across the country, wanting to know if she's okay, wanting to help, offering words of support, it has meant so much to us as her legal team. And that I have conveyed to her. And I also want to mention that all of the Zorowski plaintiffs, each of the 20 women who are suing their state because they, too, were forced to become yep. septic or travel out of state or put their, you know, uteruses and lives and children on the line, they have suffered this roller coaster with her. The highs, the lows, the disappointment in their politicians, in their state, the lack of guidance and, and real empathy and talk about being pro-life. Where is the government for these families and these women? It's nowhere to be found. I should note that in your uh, update to the court, you did not want to moot the case, despite the fact that the facts have changed, that you want to pursue it. We will see if that continues. I'm Molly Duane, who's doing great lawyering, and thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, the special counsel calls Donald Trump's bluff, why Jack Smith asked the Supreme Court to get involved and why this is an even bigger deal than it looks after this. Special counsel Jack Smith is trying to force a Supreme Court ruling on whether presidents have immunity for the crimes they committed in office. And so we're now waiting to hear from Donald Trump's legal team, which has been ordered by the Supreme Court to file its reply, brief, reply brief to that question next week. Yesterday, Smith shocked a lot of people by asking the Supreme Court to either definitively take up the question or say they are not going to as quickly as possible so as to preserve the schedule of his federal trial for his attempted coup that is currently set for March. Now, the procedural move that Smith used is a rare one. Usually the way this works out is sort of long drawn out process, right? So here, here's where we are. Trump filed a motion in October claiming that he could not even be tried for his crimes because the Constitution granted him immunity for his actions as president. And federal judge Tanya Chutkin, overseeing the case, considered that argument and then rejected that argument earlier this month. She issued a ruling saying no. Then what would normally happen is that Trump would file an appeal with the circuit court. That's one level up from Judge Chutkin. And then three judges would come together on that court. They would issue a judgment. I think he'd probably lose there, too. Trump could then file an en banc appeal heard by the full court, not just three judges. Then he could appeal to the Supreme Court. And then, while it was on appeal to the Supreme Court, he could say to the court, look, why don't you just put pause on this trial while you guys sort of consider these weighty arguments? And, of course, what everyone understands, as I just laid out that long process, is that the entire game here for Trump is to use that very process to delay as long as possible. 
and then in the end, hope that the Supreme Court basically aids his efforts to push this all past the election, when he may be president, and he can pardon himself or drop the case. And in making this brash move, what Smith did, called certiori before judgment, Jack Smith is saying, look, we all know the score here. <laughs> we know Trump wants to delay. We know he wants to use the length of process. And we also know this will eventually get up to you guys in the Supreme Court one way or the other. So how about we cut to the chase now? What he is doing is forcing the Supreme Court to show its cards. He is telling the court that Donald Trump has accused the gravest crime against American democracy since the Civil War. And he cannot escape accountability before the election through some set of invisible and silent procedural motions outside public attention. He's saying to the court, if you guys are going to help him out, you're going to have to do it in front of everyone. Harry Lippman served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice. He's now a senior legal columnist for the LA Times, and he joins me now. Harry, first of all, you and I have talked about this a lot, right? It was always going to be the case that he was going to find some vehicle to get this before the Supreme Court, the constitutional claim of immunity, and then hope and pray that even if he doesn't get them to the merits, they say, oh, man, this is a tough one. We need to consider this. Let's have... Uh, Oral arguments in a few months, and then we'll think about it. And while we're doing that, stay the trial. That was always the hope. What do you think of Smith's move here? I think it's a masterstroke. It's now, I mean, having done it, it looks blindingly obvious, but no one had anticipated it before. No. <laughs> it's just as you say, Chris, uh, Smith figured we could win the battle, but lose the war. We the, the court could weigh in. You know, normally, if you're ahead, you put the other guy to make the initiative. You put Trump to do all these moves, but they realized time was eating up and that, and it really was the number one focus was the clock. So um, launching this kind of, you know, leapfrog over the DC circuit, over the en banc, really puts it to the, the court and he, you know, not just says decided, but decided quickly. This is U.S. versus Nixon. And it's the yeah. maneuver that I think will be part of the history of this case when it's written. It preserves the strong possibility that the case will will still be tried in March or shortly thereafter. And if the court says no, because he's immune, as you say, that would have happened anyway. But now if they either deny cert or if they hold uphold that claim, he, we go forward, and his petition is full of uh, comments about the imperative importance of go both going forward and the question presented. It is a really, really sharp move on his Yeah, part. so they, they say this case involves an issue of exceptional national importance, given the weighty and right. consequential character of the constitutional questions at state. Only this court can provide the definitive and final resolution. And there's something to that, right? Like, we are in fairly uncharted territory here. He is, you know, I, I think his constitutional claims are bunk, and I think you agree with me, and I think Chuck and was decision was good. But it is, it's fairly novel. There's two aspects of what Smith's doing here that are so wild. One is he won at the district level. You don't appeal favorable rulings, <laughs> right? So that's part of what's so shocking. It's like, you won. You don't, when you win, you don't go and say, like, Wait, do we Absolutely, really win? Yeah. And yeah. he's leapfrogging the appellate court, right? So both of those things are just like, just to set for people, you don't do either of those things except in the rarest of cases. Like fewer than 50 times ever has the court done it. And right. by the way, he says this very curtly, exceptional importance. You need to show that to get the court to do this under right. the Supreme Court rule. And it's so obvious that that's what is there. And, you know, look, you're right that there are members of the court who might um, abet an effort to sort of delay things. But now they are forced to the issue. Remember, Justice Kavanaugh in his confirmation said U.S. versus Nixon, one of the most important cases ever. Will the court really save him on the merits as opposed to procedurally? Right. And that's going to be put to them directly in a way. And this, by the way, seems to be the last chance because the other trials are being delayed. This is now this very issue in front of the Supreme Court and the petition, the big ticket item in all of Trump land. That is exactly right. Harry Littman, thank you, as always. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Still ahead, Donald Trump's legal woes continue to deepen. What the special counsel found on Trump's personal phone and how it could be used against him at trial. That's next. 
The latest court filing special counsel Jack Smith reveals that he plans to call an expert who has extracted data from the cell phones of the ex-president, along with one unnamed person at the White House, and that this expert has determined the usage of these phones throughout the post-election period, including on and around January 6, 2021, including analyzing images found on the phones and websites visited, and has specifically identified the periods of time during which the defendant's phone was unlocked and the Twitter application was open on January 6. Joyce Vance is a former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama. She's now a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law, and she joins me now. Um, first of all, Joyce, just explain to me what, what the context is that we learned this information from Jack Smith's office about their plans to call this unnamed expert who has this phone data. Sure. So this is a standard what's called a Rule 16 disclosure. In the course of discovery, the prosecution has to tell a defendant in the court who their expert witnesses will be and some outline of what they will testify to. So we've learned not only this witness you've mentioned, but two others who will talk about geolocation data and how the crowd and individuals moved from Trump's speech on the ellipse the morning of January 6th over to the Capitol. Is this now th this way of going about it? I mean, I guess I don't know the tech involved here, but I was pretty struck to see that they have an expert who has been able to do this. Presumably, that's a government expert, right? But as someone who's you know overseen a U.S. attorney's office that prosecutes a ton of cases, what was your reaction to seeing that they apparently have this information? So it's interesting for a couple of reasons, Chris. As you indicate, we don't know who the experts are. They're not required to identify them. This document reveals that they are people who have more training than a layperson. It could be a government agent. It could be someone from the industry. But something that's worth noting here is that Jack Smith does not seem to have had to go to court to unlock these phones. Right. And they should both be government-issued phones, which would make accessing them a little bit easier. Oh. Um, lots of interesting details here that we don't know yet. So there's also the, the, the sort of context here is the call logs, right, which have always been you know, weirdly missing. Um, there, this gap of seven mm -hmm. hours in the presidential call log, that there were no calls the entire afternoon of January 6th, a gap in the presidential diary of two hours that afternoon. Um, this is early reporting by Barbara Costa saying that filling in the gap in the National Archives record of phone calls has long been a goal of the special counsel team based on my conversations of sources familiar with the probe. His personal cell metadata aids phones, text messages shared by witnesses. All of these things are pieces of puzzle. Add witness testimony to this, you start to really fill out the picture who was where and when and who they reached out to as the Capitol was under siege. This promises the possibility of actually learning some things that even the January 6th committee couldn't quite get to. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. We'll find out what calls were made on Trump's phone. The plus one, it's not clear who that is. I suspect it's likely Mark Meadows or someone else whose phone Trump was, was using. Um, but the interesting thing here is that this data and these expert witnesses can only talk about the phone being used, not who was, for instance, right. making or receiving a call. So I think Bob is right when he says expert or rather eyewitness testimony will have to fill in those blanks. And together, it could be a pretty compelling picture of what Donald Trump was trying to hide by not having these calls show up on official logs. That's a great point. There's also this other excerpt about geolocation. So this also coming from that same Rule 16 filing. Uh, Expert one plotted the location history for Google accounts and devices associated with individuals who moved on January 6 from an area at or near the ellipse to an area encompassing the United States Capitol building. It will aid the jury in understanding the movements of individuals towards the Capitol area during and after the defendant's speech at the ellipse. So this seems like the, the being able to tell the story with actual data of what happens when Donald Trump says, go, go to the Capitol. 
I think that's clearly what's happening here. And, and we've seen those maps, right, that show how, show how folks' cell phones light up on a map. And you can see people leaving the ellipse and going to the Capitol. What I'm curious about from how this is phrased is whether they'll also be talking about any particular individuals and how and at what points they might have right. made. I rather suspect that this is more about the group data, but clearly they would have access to individual sort of movements as well. That's a great point, Joyce Vance. As always, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Still to come, as President Biden stands shoulder to shoulder with the Ukrainian president, Republicans continue to delay why they refuse to lift a finger for a country fighting for its survival. Next. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was in Washington today to make a direct and personal appeal for additional military aid as Russia's invasion of his country enters its third year. Ukraine is gradually becoming less dependent on aid, and we are moving to the right, I think, right direction. And I want to discuss with the president how how to strengthen it, especially enhancing our air defense and ability to destroy Russia's logistics. Our goals for 24 are clear: take away Russia's superiority and disrupt their offensive operations. Congressional Republicans, especially those in the House, have signaled they don't want to keep supporting Ukraine in its war against Russia. Ahead of Zelensky's visit, Florida Congressman Matt Gates, one of the MAGA Republicans leading the charge against additional aid, put it plainly, quote, America has sent enough money to Ukraine. On the Senate side, Punchbowl News reports, quote, Senate Republicans indicated they don't even really want to hear from Zelensky. That's because Republicans have decided that if they are going to keep sending aid to Ukraine, they're going to charge Democrats a price for it, specifically they want a complete transformation of the policy around the U.S.-Mexico border to fit Donald Trump's desires. What the Biden administration seems to be asking for is billions of additional dollars with no appropriate oversight, no clear strategy to win, and, and none of the answers that I think the American people are owed. I have also made very clear from day one that our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. As of right now, there's no deal in sight because House Republicans want to start their holiday recess on Friday. It is that time of year. Today, President Biden made it clear what he thinks of the Republicans' attitude. Russian loyalists in Moscow celebrated when, when Republicans voted to block Ukraine aid last week. The host of a Kremlin-run show literally said, and I quote, well done, Republicans. That's good for us. If you're being celebrated by Russian propagandists, it might be time to rethink what you're doing. Now, Vladimir Putin already enacted the most audacious criminal election sabotage in recent memory back in 2016, famously. When he looks at his prospects in the war in Ukraine and American politics, it is obvious that it is in his best interest to do whatever he can to help elect Republicans again. The guys who will assist his goals by cutting off aid to Ukraine, forcing it into some settlement under conditions of surrender. Just think about the message that is being sent by Republicans right now about what Vladimir Putin should do in the 2024 elections. The simmering tension between the administrations of President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu apparently boiled over today. Biden says he warned behind closed doors that Netanyahu risks losing support across the world if the Israeli military does not change course on its, and I quote him here, indiscriminate bombing in Gaza. It's a sentiment he echoed in slightly softer language in front of cameras a few hours ago. We have made it clear to the Israelis and are aware that the, independent, the, the safety of innocent Palestinians is still of great concern. And so the actions they're taking must be consistent with attempting to do everything possible to prevent innocent Palestinian civilians from being, being hurt, murdered, killed. One of the other big sources of tension between Prime Minister, President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu is the question of what will happen in Gaza after the war. The White House is pushing for the Palestinian Authority, that's currently the governing regime in the West Bank, to take over Gaza. Netanyahu says it is a non-starter. It's worth remembering Netanyahu has facilitated the payment of millions of dollars to Hamas in Gaza to prop it up as something of a competitor to the Palestinian Authority in order to make the prospect of a two-state solution with a unified Palestinian uh, regime less likely. 
Now, this comes as the dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza gets ever more perilous under sustained airstrikes and shelling from the Israeli military. According to an analysis from the Financial Times, a larger percentage of buildings have been damaged in northern Gaza, where the uh, campaign started over the past two months, than in the entire Allied bombing campaign of Dresden in Germany during World War II, legendary as one of the most intense bombing campaigns of the war. And practically every single NGO and aid organization is shouting at the absolute top of their lungs about the scale of mass death and horror in Gaza. Leaders from many of those groups co-authored a new essay in the New York Times titled, We Are No Strangers to Human Suffering, But We've Seen Nothing Like the Siege of Gaza. Yanti Saripto is a co-author of that essay. She's president and CEO of Save the Children, which has provided aid to Palestinian children for seven decades. Peter Beinert is author of the Beinhardt Notebook on Substack, a contributor to another piece in the Times today about a path to peace in Gaza, and they both join me now. Let me start with you on this, this uh, essay. And it has been a challenge, I think. I want to read from it. You say, um, most of our organizations have been operating in Gaza for decades. We can do nothing remotely adequate to address the level of suffering without an immediate and complete ceasefire and an end to the siege. The aerial bombardments have rendered our jobs impossible. The withholding of water, fuel, food, and other basic goods has created an enormous scale of need that aid alone cannot offset. We get images of places in dire humanitarian straits a lot in, in the world. There are several hotspots right now, uh, including in Sudan and other places. As an aid organization that has experience in this, I've been struck by doctors out board and others who say there is something particularly acute here. Why? Yeah, thanks, Chris. A couple of things. And as you said, Save the Children has been doing humanitarian work for over 100 years in all these hotspots and is doing so today, from Sudan to Afghanistan to Ethiopia and anywhere else. What is unique here, it is a very small piece of land, an ever-decreasing piece of land with 2 million people, 1 million of whom are children, and there is no way to escape. In, in many of the other crises that we are present, not everybody can always get out, not everybody can flee, but a lot can. Here it is completely impossible. There's also a complete withholding of basic necessities. Water, fuel, electricity, food, also in the places where there is no fighting. So there is, you know, there is no water. We're looking at, yes, children are dying from bombing and shelling and violence. Many more will die from waterborne diseases, from hunger, if this doesn't stop. This, um, the, the, the comments by Joe Biden behind closed doors, where you use that word indiscriminate, which has been a real sort of third rail uh, thing to say, I think. Um, there, one of the weird paradoxes here always is that the Biden administration has wrapped itself very closely to Netanyahu, who is wildly unpopular in Israel, and also just has a different worldview and set of politics and values than Joe Biden does. And it feels to me like there's only so long that tension's going to be brooked. Right. But listening to Joe Biden, I think it's kind of surreal. I mean, he says international support is eroding. He's not just a political commentator like me. Correct. He's the president of the United States. Correct. The question is, if you, Joe Biden, believe it's indiscriminate, why are you sending more weapons with no restrictions on what the weapons can do? It doesn't make any sense. If you, the question, right, to he, put it on some other, to put it on somebody right. else, like some other guy is going to make decisions. You have to make the decision. Your legacy is going to be American complicity in this historic slaughter and a destruction of the very liberal international norms that you have staked your presidency on. Let me ask you something about the, the NGO community, because I've heard this critique and I'd like you to respond to it. It basically goes the following way. All these NGOs are doing important and good work in Gaza, and there's a lot of them, because it's yep. because of the weird situation that it finds itself in with, you know, it doesn't have normal trade, it doesn't have... But because of the fact that they, they are basically dependent on Hamas, which is the governing authority there, and Hamas doesn't like dissent, and that everyone sort of has to kind of accommodate them, and that the NGOs aren't going to say anything bad about them, and they're not going to criticize Hamas, so that they can operate and do the humanitarian work, but it means that groups like yours aren't really sort of like fair dealers or neutral arbiters. Yeah, we get that a lot, uh, we and others. And look, we work in super complicated crises like this one, but it's not the only one where you have that tension between the importance of access, the importance of safety and security for our staff yeah. on the ground, who we do not want to put a target on their back, as well as sticking to our humanitarian principles, neutrality, impartiality, independence, humanity. And that's the sometimes the, the dancing of the head of a pin. And that's why, yes, we do private advocacy. We sometimes speak out publicly. 
sometimes with others, sometimes alone. So, so that's, those are the constant judgments we're making. We've been very clear from the onset in this particular crisis. We abhor the events of October 7th. Hostages should be released immediately. It's great that some were released, but clearly there are still hostages left. They need to be released unconditionally, of course. So all parties here should, are absolutely guilty of fighting this, you know, of, of ensuring now that children in Gaza have no future. All parties. And they need to stop. The, the, the end of that pause, which was the only good news that we've had since everything, I mean, we got to see hostages right. released, right? I mean, it was an amazing image. I mean, the woman, Yarden, who, you know, Roman, whose, whose brother was sitting at this table, you know, she's back with the family for Hanukkah. It's like that, that, that fell apart, and there's different accounts of why. But it, it doesn't seem that, it does seem like Hamas wants the fighting to go on, that they pulled off this audacious atrocity because they want the war. When people say, well, there should be a ceasefire, like it takes two to tango. Like, can you do a ceasefire if one side wants to keep warring? Well, a ceasefire by, by its nature has to be both sides. Hamas has right. to stop its rockets. I, I think I understand the impulse by Israel, absolutely, of course, to destroy Hamas because of the, the horrors of what it did. But again, and you've made this point again and again, which is really important. One of the lessons that America learned after 9-11 is you should not depose a government unless you have an idea of what's going to come afterwards. Otherwise, you own it, and you are trapped in an insurgency. Uh, and no one seems... I mean, when you think about the work of, say, the children in Gaza the day after, what does that even mean? Yeah, everybody talks about a day after. We, we're asked... We are asked about, what would you do about the day after? And we're like, we've, we've got our 10-point plan. This is what we would do in a crisis like this. But as it, as it is today, there is no day after. What does that mean? There is no infrastructure left. There is, you know, what is it, less than a third of the hospitals are even remotely operational. Half of the homes are destroyed. That number is probably old by now. Uh, half of the, I mean, almost none of the schools are undamaged or completely destroyed. There is no infrastructure. There is no water infrastructure. Th there are no roads. People are putting tents up in the middle of the road, which, again, hampers people being able to flee anywhere. There will... So that's the hardware infrastructure question. But there is also almost no hope left like this. What do you put on that generation of children that are witnessing this level of trauma and destruction and death? Yanti, Sarifto, and Peter Beiner. Thank you both. Appreciate it. That does it for All In. You can catch us every weeknight at 8 o'clock on MSNBC. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash allinwithchris.